Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. This is Jane. She thinks she's just filling her car, but she's also filling the air with cancer-causing toxic chemicals used to boost octane and gas. What doesn't burn in the engine enters the air and your lungs, even your heart and brain. Bad for everyone, especially kids. Ethanol is a natural octane booster, clean burning and non-toxic. More ethanol means less scary stuff in our gas and in the air we breathe. And that makes your choice pretty plain. Jane, American Ethanol, cleaner air for Nebraska. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Arlen Suderman talks about demand potential for U.S. corn and soybeans. Scott Brown describes profit margins for pig producers. Ignacio Ciampiti talks about seeding rates in corn. And Brad Lubin gives an update on Farm Bill discussions. Arlen Suderman from INTL FC Stone is our corn and soybean market analyst this week with a longer term view of possible price movements. Arlen and I were part of Central Valley Ag's grain winter meetings across Nebraska last week. The topics there included concerns about trade, as well as a look at future demand for U.S. corn and soybeans. To be clear, we talked a week before the U.S. Department of Ag's supply and demand estimates, which were released Thursday. In York, our discussion included oil prices, Brazil's production potential, and how Arlen's presentations at the events seemed to cheer up attendees. Arlen, I think you were kind of the ray of hope at these meetings. You walk around with some farmers and they say, I think Arlen is bullish. Would you say that's accurate? Uh, I, I'm very careful about using the word bullish around farmers because they instantly think uh, six, seven dollar corn and, and by no means. I am friendly to the markets uh, from the standpoint that uh, uh, from my study of the markets and involvement of the funds, I found that when they are bullish the commodity sector, I'll use the term there, and they, and they are believers in the commodity sector, that that does impact the price, the cash price on the farm. On corn, it's 50, uh, 50 cents or so above what you would expect it to be relative to the fundamentals when they're bullish. Uh, when they're bearish, a the commodity sector, it's 50 cents to the negative side. And I see this changing tide right now. It's too early to fully confirm, it's just the early signs of it. But it looks like the funds are starting to fall in love with the commodities. The grains have been the lagger, but they're cautiously now coming into the grains too now, thinking maybe it's time to close the gap. One of the triggers of that was the break in the dollar we've seen over the last month, which has accelerated to the downside and are starting to realize uh, just how much more attractive that makes our commodities. They're, they're starting to come in and buy. Fundamentally, we can point to some things too. We still have plenty of grain around, certainly. But there is some sign that maybe the worst is behind us. And so the funds like hearing that, and that, that piques their interest. What are your thoughts long term? Maybe some demand potential out into the future? Oh, well, the good news is the U.S. economy is taking off, and the global economy is taking off. Uh, we're seeing some good health in the European economy, finally. And uh, it, when Europe's healthy, that tends to help make uh, China healthy. And they're the largest importer of uh, commodities, raw commodities. So as the economies get stronger, demand for commodities strengthens. Uh, demand for the commodities is strong. The ags is strong. Uh, it's just we've been oversupplying with a couple of really big crop years on both sides of the equator. That we go back toward a more normal production type of a cycle, all of a sudden that demand starts to peak, uh, starts to use up those supplies once again, and it just helps to firm prices. Now that's good news perhaps for U.S. producers, but Brazil is also producing a lot of corn and beans and they believe they can significantly scale up production. Do you consider Brazil to be a threat in this? Oh, uh, very much Brazil is someone has to be respected. The amount of territory and brushland and pasture they can clear for cropland, not touching the rainforest, uh, is equivalent to the Great Plains stretching from Canada down to the Texas Gulf. 
that is not being developed to a great extent because of the corruption in government, the, their economic problems and a lot of that, and I see that being around for quite some time. So long term they are a legitimate concern, um, but f for now the demand is there if, if we can just get back to more reasonable yields on both sides of the equator. There have been several questions about NAFTA at these meetings, but you think that TPP could actually be more critical to U.S. farmers. Why? Yeah, I, I really do. When you look at the participants in the TPP um, and the buyers and the sellers and the producers that are in there, I, I think for the most part corn and soybeans are probably going to fare pretty well. Wheat um, and the meat market, particularly beef, I, I think we could really see some pain there if we're not a part of TPP. Um, and I noticed that uh, President Trump, in the absence of having anybody on his staff being approved by the Senate yet to negotiate bilateral agreements, is starting to talk about maybe getting back into TP, TPP since they're moving forward with it without us. And uh, that's probably a good sign that we probably need to be involved to protect those markets. What is your short-term and long-term outlook for wheat? It's an interesting commodity in this part of the world right now. Well, it is, and it's particularly of concern to corn farmers because it's that huge supply of feed wheat that we have in the world that's kind of a lid on the corn market, and even including here in the United States. Uh, big supplies, I see reduced acres this year, and with normal yields, we'll continue to ratchet down the supply of wheat. Most of the surplus wheat that we have elsewhere in the world is primarily in Russia where they have uh, constricting uh, infrastructure at this point, and in China where they're trying to keep it all for themselves, so to speak. Uh, here in the United States, the big concern, of course, is uh, with the drought and a winter kill. We won't know the full effects of the winter kill until it breaks dormancy, but we do know that the winter wheat ratings in Kansas and Oklahoma, those key wheat production states, have absolutely plummeted and uh, it does suggest we've got some serious problems, and the forecasts are that those areas will stay dry right on through the heading period, so we could be taking care of some of those surplus supplies. Let's end with a very practical look here at uh, oil markets and what you think might be a good opportunity or when might be a good opportunity to lock in some fuel prices. Yeah, crude oil is a leading indicator for the funds toward the commodities as well. When we look at the energy market, uh, supplies here in the United States are more toward typical levels now. We worked out the surplus even with the big increase in shale oil production. The funds have built record ownership, speculative ownership in it. Uh, this is a market that's past due for a correction, just like the stock market, um, but yet the brakes keep being bought. People ask me, when will there be a break so I can book my diesel fuel needs? Uh, you would expect there will be one. Uh, we've seen a little consolidation now. There's a little bit of nervousness, but so far every break's been bought. So I really can't guarantee there be one like the stock market over the past year. Next week, Jeff Peterson from Heartland Farm Partners will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. We also have a look at hog markets this week with University of Missouri Extension Ag Economist Scott Brown. After the United States set a monthly record for pork exports in November, we knew 2017 was on pace to be a strong year. December's export total, released this week, was more than enough to push the U.S. to a new yearly record. 2017's total was nearly 5% above the previous high set in 2012. That demand has continued to help the market. Prices for the February 2018 Lean Hogs Futures contract held above $70 a hundredweight through all of January, and peaked close to $76 earlier this week. We talked with Scott Wednesday afternoon and began by asking him to recap price movements so far this year. Well, Jeff, we've started 2018 with uh, prices that are very near where we were a, a year ago when we started the year, so it's been a, a good start to 2018 despite what's been some increased supply of pork to the marketplace. What does the profit outlook look like for 2018? You know, right now I would say that uh, we may still see 2018 as another profitable year for the pork industry. And, you know, I, I go two things at play here. Number one, uh, market prices for pork that have stayed higher than maybe we would have thought uh, for, for 2017 and 2018. But in addition, I think when we look at the cost side of the equation, uh, I see nothing that's going to move corn prices higher uh, as, as we go through 2018, barring a uh, short weather crop uh, here in the U.S. So cheap feed and, and reasonable hog prices, uh, we might mark another year with uh, uh, some, some modest black ink when it's all said and done. How strong is the market for feeder pigs? So it's been a phenomenal market, uh, ex especially as we 
ended 2017 and, and entered into 2018, I, I, I think you sure can see that uh, there's demand for feeder pigs out there in, in many parts of, of the U.S. Again, I'd say part of that has to be associated with what's been $3 corn for uh, much of the I states that might be interested in feeding some hogs. Uh, but when you talk about uh, feeder pig prices that are pushing $90, I don't think many of us would have probably seen that coming. Uh, perhaps that's just uh, a, a good indication of there's a lot of capacity to, f to, to feed hogs available to us today, and those feeder pig prices uh, reflect that strength. The Americans set a pork export record for the country this year, or in 2017, I should say. Why has the U.S. been able to be so competitive? Well, I think when you look back at 2017, it's, it's important to remind ourselves that probably the first half of 2017 was uh, a, a, a strong half as a result of what was going on with Mexico. Um, we, we hope that continues and being a close neighbor for us, uh, I, I think that's been helpful uh, to, to our record. But at the same time, uh, you know, we did see the, the dollar weaken relative to some currencies around uh, the, the globe that I think was helpful to, to trade in, in pork products. And, I, I, I'd be remiss not to remind us that uh, global economy continues to grow and, and get better as we, uh, as we went through 2017 and I think that put more money in the pockets of many consumers around the, around the world and, and part of that demand ended up uh, giving us some additional U.S. pork exports. Where would the majority of competition come from, the EU? Well, I think when you look ahead in 2018, I do worry about what happens uh, with the EU and, and here's where we can talk about uh, Japan for just a second. With the recent EU-Japanese uh, agreement, uh, I, I worry about whether or not we can stay competitive without our own uh, new bilateral uh, agreement. I think many of us were looking forward to the opportunity to export more U.S. pork to Japan with the changes in the gate price mechanism that we would have seen from a successful Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. But now that that's gone and, and we've seen the EU uh, enter a new agreement with Japan, I worry about the, the, how level that playing field is and as we look ahead, whether the EU gains a lot more of that market than uh, we can. And, and it's important, although we set a record in 2017, when you think about just the sheer amount of pork that we're going to be producing the next couple of years, we need records uh, in 2018 and 2019 as well. What is your price forecast? So I go, that's a tough, uh, tough question to, to answer right now. I guess as I look ahead in 2018, I, I see very much a repeat of where we were in 2017 with maybe uh, $3 a weakness as we go through the year relative to where we were in 2017. Uh, you know, I like to remind us when we got some pretty high hog prices in the mid part of 2017, that was about the time we saw pork belly prices that got uh, near $2.20 a pound. I'm not certain we get that strong on pork belly prices as we go in 2018, so I think that moderates uh, where we end up in terms of hog prices. Now the flip side of that is we know we have more capacity coming on in 2018 and we're going to chase uh, hogs a little harder from a processing standpoint. I think that can be supportive to hog prices but at the same time I think this ultimately hinges on what we can sell pork out the back end of those plants at and I think when we see pork belly prices not quite as strong this year uh, we'll, we'll see barrel and gilt prices slip uh, again three to four dollars. We should note 2017 was also a record year for American beef and veal exports. The U.S. shipped almost 2.9 billion pounds of product, surpassing the previous top set in 2011. The USDA believes the largest operating cost for corn farmers this year will be fertilizer. Seed expenses are projected to come in second, making up nearly a third of that total. Kansas State University's Ignacio Ciampiti believes growers should take a closer look at altering corn seeding rates within fields because of the variability much of the land offers. We talked with Ignacio at the recent Nebraska Crop Management Conference in Kearney and began by asking how farmers can assess their seeding rates. Well, I think that when you look at in specifically on seeding rates in corn, we, we, have, we conducted a nice um, multi-state review paper uh, working uh, in collaboration with Pioneer. And what we did basically in that study is that we asked the company and we collaborate partner getting all the information that they have from the last uh, 30 years. They have thousands of observations. They do uh, excellent studies every year. So our concept was many times we, we think about the seeing rate and the recommendation on seeing rate specifically on corn is really connected to your yield potential. When you're looking at environments, 
that you can achieve 300 whooshes or more, then it's a moment that you might be able to start pushing seeing rates and get a really good response. In dry land environments, very susceptible environments, when you move to less than 150 whooshes, then is when seeing rain can become a stress factor. And, and in, in our situation, basically, in many of our publications that, that we, we put together with them, we, we look at this idea of saying, let's start from the basics of precision ag. When a farmer is, is buying a new field and is looking at that field, in that field, in a 60 acre, in a 120 acre field, you have variability. So the field is never uniform. So one of the best way to start working with that variability is start looking at what are the best areas of the field and what are the worst areas of the field. So in some way, we start working with so many of our farmers to look at that information, even using satellite data, uh, and trying to make a map early before the growing season and promote them to start thinking about the idea of zone. It, this is not a variable rate. It's just to say, if I know that this area of the field 30 or 50 acres are highly productive, and they are more than 250 bushes, why I will be treating those acres in the same way that 120 bushel potential? It's worth it to shift around? Exactly, of course, and, and it's not too hard to do it because if you think about the economics and if you think about the, the, the benefits that you might have in doing that, Imagine the situation that in a 120 bushel environment, in a very susceptible environment, it could be an area of the field that is um, a depression or is compacted. That area of the field, when you are pushing the same population that your pivot or a high yielding situation, what you're doing is you are creating the opposite effect. That area of the field, not, not only you are investing more seeds that you don't really need, but also you are creating a response that it could be a negative response. So this is a new concept that many times when farmers are thinking the economics, and we know that the seed cost is one of the main economics for corn. I, we, we always encourage farmers to start looking at variability in the fields and start becoming more uh, business oriented in looking at how I can manage that variability in a way that I can potentially invest the same amount of resources, but invest it in a way that is allocated in a high yielding situation versus a low yielding environment. And believe me, we have many of our farms that we can clearly divide in two or three different zones and start playing with these ideas. Ignacio will join us again in a few weeks to talk about nitrogen use in soybean production. The February Nebraska farmer explains how sorghum might be able to give a yield boost to a following corn crop. This month's issue talks about price potential for sorghum as well as the benefits it may provide by saving moisture. You can read more about the experiences some Nebraska producers have had growing sorghum in the February Nebraska Farmer. Nebraska Extension, in partnership with Kansas State Extension and Research, will hold five Farm Bill forums in late February and early March. Three of those meetings will be held in Nebraska, March 5th at the Eastern Nebraska Research and Extension Center near Mead, March 6th in Scottsbluff, and the 7th in Hastings. The events come during what's expected to be a rough financial year for American producers. The Department of Agriculture Wednesday projected net farm income in 2018 will be down almost 7 percent from 2017 and the lowest since 2006. Brad joined us Wednesday morning to give an update on the progress for a new farm bill. Well, we know the discussions are ongoing and we know that there's been work on both the House and Senate side, I think, to feel out the legislation that will be introduced, but we're still waiting for that formal introduction. We're waiting on a process that really is time to solving the budget issues first uh, before we can really proceed with language in either committee. Are there any hang-ups right now? We do have some challenges in this farm bill and the biggest seem to be cotton and dairy. If we have to solve them in the farm bill, they are big issues. Uh, if a budget, bill, a budget deal takes care of them, uh, at least beforehand, then the farm bill doesn't have to solve them directly and the process may move forward more expeditiously. We talk so much about the agricultural aspect of this, but the largest portion, the vast majority, is related to SNAP, right. Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Do you expect changes there? Well, on the SNAP side, or the nutrition title, which is 75% plus of the total farm bill spending as of the last projection, uh, we do expect a, a fight over, or at least a debate over, potential reforms. Potential reforms to eligibility, maybe reforms to benefits and operations. But I think fundamentally we have to remember that any proposals over there generally stay on that side of the ledger. We don't expect that we can cut 
food assistance programs as a way to pay for uh, something else in the bill. It's, it's, really, it's really its own debate. Will there be any shifts in ARC or PLC farm programs? We do expect some major uh, changes, at least proposed, to ARC, particularly with the yield data. Uh, question of the source of the data and some challenges, some, some debate that's been ongoing now for at least a couple years about which data source is used, uh, whether it's from survey data collected by the National Ag Statistics Service or whether it's yield data reported to crop insurance agents that's available from the Risk Management Agency. Uh, we also might debate the history of that data, how many years of data uh, of yield data go into those guarantees. But for all the debate over changing ARC, um, the real fundamental question in the next Farm Bill is, uh, will we have a new decision, which we expect, between ARC and PLC in the next Farm Bill? Are some of those changes aimed at reducing the variation from county, county to county? Fundamentally, the questions over yield are a question of consistencies in data that are, that are heightened or highlighted with those discrepancies in payment rates across county. We can go through the equation, we can know that ARC is meant to pay on a county level based on county performance, so there, su there are supposed to be differences. Mm -hmm. But if there are differences in the data source, there might be some inconsistencies that producers have been concerned about. Okay, finally, crop insurance, as always, one of the targets mm -hmm. for legislators. What might be targeted right. this year? Right, while ag groups uh, and industry groups might argue the fundamental purpose or the fundamental uh, uh, push should be to maintain crop insurance as the foundation of the safety net. Uh, we know that it's been targeted before. We expect the committees to be strongly supportive of crop insurance in any legislation that's forwarded to the floor, but we also expect a floor fight over potential changes. Some potential cuts to eligibility in terms of a premium subsidy limit or an adjusted gross income cap on, on eligibility to participate, but that could potentially throw out some producers and it doesn't just affect those producers. It affects the, the performance of the program as a whole, which might affect the premiums paid by the people that remain. So that's a bigger challenge to the program. Uh, we also see a proposal to cut the harvest price component uh, and the subsidy for that harvest price coverage. Well, that looks like an add-on, and it has an estimated cost, but it's also the fundamental component of crop insurance that matches with a good marketing strategy. So unless you want to damage sort of the overall risk management uh, performance of the program, uh, that's, a, that's a tough one to pick on. And, and then finally you have potentially the premium subsidy uh, support. Uh, currently that overall average is around 62 percent of all premium dollars come from the federal government. At what level might that, what level might that be reduced to uh, without substantially affecting participation in the program? Uh, that may be the biggest question on crop insurance. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we begin for the weekly forecast and during this last week we dealt with numerous waves of energy movement across our region that supported some light snow activity. No major heavy snowfall, this was a light fluffy type of precipitation. And as we went through the Saturday through Sunday morning time period, most of the snow accumulations that were significant were in the uh, northwestern one half of the state. Uh, from Sunday morning through Monday morning, we've seen that shift into southwest, south central Nebraska. Uh, Monday morning through Tuesday morning, more primarily impacting the southeastern half of the state. And then as we go, we went in from Tuesday morning to Wednesday morning, we've seen most of the activity south of Interstate 80, basically the heaviest south central and southeast Nebraska. When we looked at the total accumulations, including what's come through the last 24 hours, looking at snowfall rates of anywhere from three to upwards of eight inches so far reported, the heaviest activity in portions of southwest, south central, and into central Nebraska. Unfortunately, when you take and melt this snowfall down, the water equivalency was just not there. Basically, 1,500 to a quarter of an inch on the higher totals, and that's generally what happens when you have temperatures 20, or below, 20 degrees or lower when you have snowfall. We need to have temperatures up in the upper 20s to get those real nice wet juicy snow totals. Now the system that's working through this weekend represents our biggest opportunity for significant snowfall and even that is just light accumulations and then we see a warming trend as we go to the midweek. So as we go to the upper air models what we will notice for presently is that we have this upper air trough responsible for our snowfall. Most of the energy moving to the east of us we're seeing that snow levels 
basically sag toward the south as high pressure builds in. So these low pressures in the southwestern United States may have enough lift to basically produce some accumulating snowfall, particularly over the southern one half of the state in northern Kansas. Heavier precipitation over the southeast. Then as we go into tomorrow, we have a little piece of a wave moving through the mid layers of the atmosphere that may actually support continued snowfall, particularly in the morning across northern Nebraska, or excuse me, northern Kansas and southern Nebraska, as we see this light snowfall and a little bit of precipitation showing up in southern Colorado. Now as we go into the day Monday, the trough starts to split basically two pieces of energy with an upper air low trying to form in the southwestern United States. So we see these low pressure systems at the surface represented by that upper air low. High pressure over the northern plains moving in. So this area across the northern plains looks like light snow. Heavier precipitation runs through the southeastern United States. And you can see this low basically cutting off as the northern stream starts to gain a little bit of energy. So most of the systems will move in toward the Great Lakes region on Tuesday. High pressure firmly in place over uh, the central United States on the backside starts to bring warmer temperatures into our our region with scattered snow basically over the northern United States. On Wednesday, we do see that trough digging down a little bit farther, but it comes down over Colorado and then moves eastward. So we're going to see some downsloping winds and warmer temperatures building in. We do have low pressure basically showing at the surface, but most of the activity will remain to our north as we stay pretty much dry across the southern part of the state at least. And as we get in the day Thursday, as that trough moves toward the east, we get uh, winds coming out of a northerly direction. High pressure moves in, so a slight cool down on th Thursday. And then as we go in for precipitation, we start to see the activity increasing across the southern plains. And as we go on the day Friday, the upper air trough itself moves over to the Great Lakes. We see warming conditions over the northern United States, particularly the northwestern United States. Low pressure starts to make its way into the southern plains region. And this represents the first significant amount of moisture that many of these areas have seen over the last three to potentially four months, depending on where you are located in this region. So as we go to the eight to 14 day forecast, a continuation of the trend for bringing warmer temperatures in for the second full week of the month. And in terms of precipitation, we are looking at dry conditions building into the entire western one half of the United States. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on demand potential for U.S. commodities, profit margins for pig producers, corn seeding rates, and farm bill discussions. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Next week, Jeff Peterson will be our market analyst, and Nebraska Extension's Greg McKee will join us to discuss the latest on the Section 199 tax deduction. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.